All right. Um, I'm sorry I had to break up these two parts of this lecture. I um, had to take a break. I had to stop partway through, and I didn't want it to backtrack on audio. So I went ahead and uploaded the first part. Uh, this is the second part of the gene genetic engineering lecture. Um, and I left off here talking about all of the benefits and all of the things that could be made using this recombinant DNA technology. Um, I told you several times about the example of trying to create E. coli cells or some other type of microbe that would express human insulin. Um, so this technique of, of creating a recombinant microbe does allow us to uh, have large-scale manufacturing of various hormones, enzymes, or vaccines, such as insulin for diabetics. Um, human growth hormone is another great example. Some forms of dwarfism are treated with human growth hormone, and they used to isolate that human growth hormone from cadavers. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's relatively expensive because there's not a large supply. And also there is the distinct possibility of transferring an infectious agent from the cadaver to your patient. So what they've done now is they've actually uh, moved the gene for human growth hormone into goats. And the goats are actually expressing this human growth hormone and you can isolate it from their milk uh, and then use it to treat patients. Another similar example would be factor eight for hemophiliacs. Factor eight is a clotting protein. Um, they used to isolate factor eight from donated blood plasma, uh, but unfortunately what was happening is that they were transferring HIV to patients when they would receive this, these factor eight injections. Uh, so uh, what they've done now is they put the gene for factor eight into pigs and the pigs express factor eight and it's uh, collected from their milk, refined, and then used to treat patients. Uh, the hepatitis B vaccine is another example. It's being produced in yeast cells. Uh, and all of these examples, the real benefit here is one, safety. Uh, you don't have to worry about trying to isolate these products from uh, humans. Instead, you're, you're getting them from microbes that can be tightly controlled and regulated so you're sure not to have infectious agents. And also it's cheaper. It's, it's much cheaper to grow large quantities of yeast cells producing a vaccine than it would be uh, to try and collect it from human samples. And then of course large supplies, enough to treat a significant number of patients. So these are the benefits to this type of recombinant DNA technology. Now we've talked about recombinant microbes several times now, uh, where the microbes are synthesizing a variety of various uh, proteins that can be used in medicine or agriculture or bioremediation or industry. Uh, we've talked mostly about medicine, but you can also have a microbe that's making something that's useful for some other part of life. So, for example, you can have microbes that are producing something that's important for bioremediation. Remember the examples that I was telling you about where they use bacteria that they sprinkle on the surface of oil spills for the bacteria to digest that oil and get rid of it. Well, those were genetically engineered bacteria. What they did is they took normal marine organisms and they put in plasmids that contain the genes for digesting oil. And they did transformation for them to take in those genes. And that's how they created those organisms, is, is for uh, bioremediation through this process. Uh, you can also produce microbes that are important from an agricultural perspective. Uh, for example, um, one of the probably most useful samples here is a bacteria that's in the genus Pseudomonas and what they've done is they've actually put a plasmid into that bacteria that has a gene that's sort of like antifreeze uh, and it allows the bacteria to survive in uh, very very cold environments without freezing and in fact what farmers do is they when they plant their uh, crops they'll mix some of this bacteria into the soil and the bacteria act like antifreeze, protecting the roots of the plant against possible freezing. Very cool um, application of this technology. Now, in addition to recombinant microbes, you can also create uh, transgenic plants. 
where you can have plants that are synthesizing various vitamins or medicines or some kind of agriculturally important substance. Um, so for example, the rice that had vitamin A at the beginning of this lecture, uh, the golden rice, that's an example of a transgenic plant. Um, we'll see a couple more examples in just a moment where you can have plants uh, producing some extra protein that you want them to have. Similarly, you can create transgenic animals where you have animals that are synthesizing uh, some sort of medicine like the pigs that make factor eight or the goats that make human growth hormone. You can also use this technique to create animal models of human diseases. So there are several diseases that are really specific to just humans. Let's do an example. Uh, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is only found in humans. Animals don't get cystic fibrosis. But that makes it really quite difficult to study because, again, it's only found in humans, and humans are much more difficult to work with than an animal, of course. So what you can do is you can put the genes responsible for cystic fibrosis into an animal and create this animal version of cystic fibrosis. And now all of a sudden you can study the disease and you can test various treatments and things like that um, on animals instead of on humans. Let's go through, through uh, examples on how you make transgenic plants or transgenic animals. Creating transgenic plants. Uh, creating transgenic plants depends on a particular soil bacteria from the genus Agrobacterium. Okay. So this is the genus. There are several species in that genus that do this function, but Agrobacterium is the genus name here. Um, Agrobacterium is interesting in the fact that he naturally transforms plant cells. This is part of his normal natural behavior is to transform plant cells. He does this all by himself out in nature. So here you see Agrobacterium. The particular type of plasmid that Agrobacterium has is called the TI plasmid. And what Agro does is he encounters this plant and he's just going to push his plasmid into the plant cell, transforming the plant cell. This is normal, natural behavior by Agrobacterium. In fact, it happens all the time. And if we think to ourselves, why would Agrobacterium do this? Why would it push a plasmid into a plant cell? Well, it turns out that the TI plasmid encodes all of the information for making agro's favorite food source. So agrobacterium comes up next to a plant cell, pushes the plasmid into the plant cell, and the plant begins to produce the food that agro wants to eat. In fact, that's why they call it a TI plasmid. TI stands for tumor inducing. Um, as the agro infects the plant and the plant makes the, makes the food product, the agro will grow and multiply through binary fission and form a great big tumor on the side of the plant as it's eating all of those food sources. This is really the epitome of laziness. Right? This is uh, agrobacterium sending his recipe for his favorite dinner across to the plant cell, and the plant cell spends all of the energy to make the food for agro. Well, how is this useful to us if we put our gene of interest onto the TI plasmid and put the TI plasmid into agro, agro will deliver its plasmid along with our gene into the plant cell. So you can create a plant cell that's making your gene of interest or expressing your gene of interest. Let's do an example. Let's use the same thing. Let's say we want to create a tomato plant that is expressing human insulin. So our gene of interest is human insulin. First thing we have to do is isolate and amplify our gene of interest. What technique does that? PCR. PCR will isolate and amplify the human insulin gene from the human genetic donor. How do we tell the PCR to only copy human insulin and nothing else? Good primer design. Designing your primers properly 
uh, will allow it to copy only what's between the primers, and you get lots of copies of just the human insulin gene. Next, you have lots of copies. You need to put that gene onto the TI plasmid. So you purchase the TI plasmid. You can buy it online from a, from a catalog. Purchase the TI plasmid. You've got to cut a hole in it. How do you cut a hole in the TI plasmid? A restriction endonuclease. How do you glue your gene of interest into the TI plasmid? Ligase seals it in. Now, how do you get your TI plasmid with the gene of interest into agro? How do you get it to take in that plasmid? Transformation using chemicals or uh, electricity. Now, you have agrobacterium with the TI plasmid in red and the gene of interest in blue. Now, what you do is you simply kind of scrape the side of the stalk of the tomato plant, so just like scrape it a little bit and slap that agrobacterium that contains your TI plasmid and the gene of interest on top of your, your scraping. And agrobacterium will actually deliver the TI plasmid into the plant cell. And the plant will begin to make human insulin. Now your patients can eat the tomato plant, eat the tomatoes, and get the insulin that way. Uh, Agrobacterium easily infects all of the grass plants, so it works really well on anything related to the grass plants, including potatoes, tomatoes, bananas, tobacco. All of those grass plants are easily infected uh, by agrobacterium. Let's look at some more examples of plants created this way. In the top picture, you're looking at tobacco plants, easily infected by agro. Um, on the bottom line here, these are wild-type tobacco plants. On the top line, we're looking at tobacco plants that are expressing a uh, herbicide resistance gene. Right? So the gene they got, the little blue gene here on the TI plasmid, was herbicide resistance. In, in other words, the ability to survive an herbicide, you know, like Roundup. All right, so what you're looking at is here's a zero herbicide in the soil. Here's increasing concentrations of herbicide in the soil. And you'll see that the tobacco plants that are expressing the resistance gene are growing just fine. And the wild type ones are dying off. So to the, to the farmer, what this means is you could actually spray your whole area with herbicide and it won't hurt your tobacco plants. It will only kill off the weeds. Another example here of how this could be used on the right hand side are wild type peas. Peas uh, are, are a prime food source for a little bug called weevils and the weevils will digest the carbs in the peas and of course turn them rancid. On the left hand side you're looking at peas from plants that are expressing a gene that blocks weevil digestion. So the weevils cannot digest those peas. So what you've done is essentially increase the shelf life of these peas. Uh, you won't have nearly as much that gets destroyed by weevils um, by having this gene there on, in your pea plants. Another example, when I was at Loma Linda, I worked down the hall from a lab where they were trying to create a cholera vaccine. And they were trying to put that cholera vaccine into a potato plant. Um, so they put the genes for the vaccine into the potato plant using agrobacterium and the TI plasmid. And the potato plant would then synthesize these proteins, these vaccine proteins, and if you ate the potato, you would become vaccinated against cholera. Um, early results were promising. It seemed to work very well. Patients did actually become immunized against cholera if they ate this transgenic potato problem was you had to eat it raw. If you ate a cooked potato or a fried potato, you didn't get the same vaccination benefit. So, eh, little snafu to work out there, but, you know, promising nonetheless. Um, and actually, there are some vaccines that are currently being produced in apples, and what they can do is actually make apple juice from those apples and then use that as a vaccination technique. So patients come in and to vaccinate them against that disease, you just give them a little cup of apple juice. Uh, and as they drink it, they will be exposed to the vaccine and protect it.
All right, let's see how you create transgenic animals. Creating transgenic animals, in theory, is quite uh, simplistic, but in practice is much more difficult. Uh, so here's the theory behind creating transgenic animals, an animal that expresses a gene that you wouldn't expect to be there. So first off, you're going to collect embryos. Okay? So you collect these embryos, you're then going to hold on to it with a little micro pipette. It uses gentle suction just to hold the embryo steady under the microscope. And with a very fine pipette, you're going to inject your gene of interest into the nucleus of the embryo. Um, now what you're hoping is that the DNA of that embryo is going to integrate your gene of interest into its genome. That's what you're hoping for, and that seems to be the most difficult part of this. Uh, it's relatively simplistic to simply inject a gene into the nucleus. It's totally different to try and stimulate the DNA of the embryo to uh, uptake this gene and to incorporate it into its genome. So success rates are not so good. It takes quite a few tries before you get one that works. Right? But once you do have that, then you're going to implant this embryo that now has the gene of interest into a female. Let it develop the way all uh, the, let it develop the way all embryos develop, and then you have a new animal that's expressing whatever your gene of interest is. So the benefit here is that you could uh, make animals that have a specific gene, such as human growth hormone, so that they can produce it, uh, and then you can isolate it for treatment. You can also create an animal model for a human disease. Again, there are human diseases that are only found in humans, and you can create a model using these sorts of techniques. And maybe one day we could even grow organs. We could grow human organs inside of animals using these sorts of techniques. Right now that's not possible, but it's not very far away from possibility. Some examples here of transgenic animals. Um, on the left-hand side, we're looking at transgenic mice. Uh, these are mice that, um, on the left-hand side, it's a wild-type mouse. But on the right-hand side, it's a mouse that's expressing human growth hormone. Uh, and you can see the difference in size here because of that extra growth hormone in the mouse. Now, of course, when we think about making human growth hormone to treat patients, uh, mice aren't the best option. You don't particularly um, want to have to milk mice in order to obtain human growth hormone. That's not going to be very effective. Um, but my, we do know a lot about mice, and they do have a very short lifespan, so they're often used early on when we're testing techniques to see if it's even possible. They'll often start with mice. They have a short lifespan. We know a lot about mice because people have been working with them for a long time. Uh, so that's often where we'll start in order to figure out if it's possible. And once we figure out that it's possible to put human growth hormone hormone into an animal, then we can start talking about uh, moving it into an animal where it would be worth producing human growth hormone, like a goat, which is where it's currently made. On the right hand side, you're looking at piglets that are synthesizing human factor 8. Remember, factor 8 is involved in blood clotting. Hemophiliacs need factor 8 in order for their blood to clot properly. Um, these are piglets that have been bioengineered to produce human factor 8. Uh, they produce it in their bloodstream. They also produce it in their milk. Uh, it's isolated from their milk and then refined and given to patients, hemophiliac patients. Um, these piglets, by the way, are living the high life in this beautiful facility in Scotland. That's where the um, company is that created the, these pigs that express human factor 8. Um, I saw a documentary once about them, and, and they are living in this beautiful, absolutely clean facility uh, in, in Scotland. Remember that these pigs are worth a lot of money. A lot of work and research went into them. They're very expensive pigs, and hence they are well, care for, well cared for. Uh, these pigs live a better lifestyle than I do, I'll tell you that right now. Um, 
We could isolate factor eight from their blood, but again, they are so expensive that instead they're isolating it from their milk. Um, so that, that's a much cheaper way to isolate uh, human factor eight because you're not killing the animal. You can continue to isolate more factor eight from the, from the animal later. All right, so those are ways to create animals that are expressing a particular gene, a new gene. But if we think about treating patients, if a patient comes into you, into your office, and they have some sort of genetic problem, you can't just give them a new copy of a gene that way. Um, they're well past the embryo stage. You can't create this new patient embryo. Um, in other words, what can we do to treat a patient that's past the embryo stage? Uh, and, the, and the theory for that is called gene therapy. Gene therapy is a way to repair or replace a patient's faulty gene. So if we look at our diabetic example again, imagine uh, we talked about ways to produce human insulin to deliver to patients, but wouldn't it be even nicer if we could deliver a gene into our patients so that they make their own insulin? They no longer have to take medication on a daily basis, multiple times a day. Instead, they're simply making their own insulin. That would be gene therapy, a way to repair or replace a patient's faulty gene. Now, the background here, the first time this gene therapy technique was used was on a four-year-old girl. She had a severe immunodeficiency problem. She was lacking... Um, a gene, well, she really had a mutated version of this gene, and it's a gene that controls many parts of the human immune system. So without this gene being active, uh, the patient really has no immune system. Lifespan of this little girl is very, very short. We don't expect her to live long because she doesn't have an active immune system. So she was the first time where they said, all right, we know she's not going to survive unless we try something. So let's try this, rel this uh, revolutionary technique and see if it works. And this is gene therapy. So here's what they do. First thing, you need to isolate and amplify your gene of interest. So if this four-year-old girl has an immunodeficiency problem because she's lacking an immune gene, what would be your genetic donor? a healthy human cell. And what's your gene of interest? The immune gene that she's lacking. How would you isolate and amplify that gene of interest? PCR. And how would you make sure that the PCR happened only on the gene you're interested in and nothing else? Good primer design. So the first step here to isolate and amplify the gene of interest is a PCR using good primer design. Right. Next, you want to get that gene into some sort of a vector. It turns out that plasmid vectors don't work very well for animal cells, so very rarely are plasmids used when we talk about transforming animal cells. Instead, um, what was used was a virus. So here's a virus. Uh, this is an empty virus capsid, and you simply put your gene of interest into this empty virus capsid. Right. So isolate and amplify your gene of interest with PCR. Put your gene into an empty virus capsid. Then you take samples from your patient, cell samples of, from your patient, so here we're isolating bone marrow cells, and you infect those cells with your virus that has your gene of interest inside. The uh, virus then infects the cells. Hopefully, what you're hoping for is that the gene of interest will get incorporated into your patient's genome. Again, that seems to be the tricky part. Then you would grow these cells several uh, generations and eventually return them to your patient. The hope being that your patient now is permanently producing whatever that gene is. Uh, permanently expressing that gene of interest. Now, theoretically, this is a permanent treatment, although in actuality, early results showed that it rarely was truly permanent. 
The hardest part of this process appears to be getting the uh, genome of your patient's cells to um, incorporate your gene of interest. That seems to be the most difficult part. And even if they do incorporate that gene, sometimes after a couple of different generations, it'll just pop that gene back out again. Nobody's really sure why that is, but that seems to be a common problem. So it doesn't look like it's a truly permanent solution, um, even though theoretically it should be, it, it doesn't appear to be permanent. This treatment was becoming more and more popular for various different diseases until tragedy struck um, in the year 2000. Two young men who were being treated for leukemia uh, using gene therapy died a horrific death uh, and upon autopsy they realized that these two patients died of a terrible viral infection. So if we go back and look at what happened it turns out that the virus vector wasn't completely cleansed of viral DNA. So some of the viruses had the gene of interest inside of them and some of the viruses still had viral DNA. Now remember, in order to do gene therapy, these patients have to be very sick already. This is not something that one would undertake lightly. Um, however, as sick as you may be, uh, if we're using a virus that every now and then still has viral DNA, that is deadly uh, and not acceptable whatsoever as you can imagine. So after these two young men died of viral infections using gene therapy, all gene therapy work across the world stopped as the entire scientific communities took a step back and went, whoa, um, this may be too dangerous. This may be a problem. The technique works in theory. The problem is that the virus vector is just too dangerous. So current research on gene therapy and techniques in gene therapy have focused on alternative vectors, other things that could be used instead of a virus to get that DNA into your patient's cell. Um, some ideas that are currently out there, there's what's called a gene gun. Uh, a gene gun takes these tiny dissolvable pellets and you roll the pellets around in the gene of interest and then you use pressurized air to blow those little dissolvable pellets into the cells um, and then the pellets dissolve inside of the cell and release the gene. That's one uh, current idea out there. Another idea that they're using is to use what are called liposomes. A liposome is a type of vesicle. Remember that a vesicle is a membrane bound sac. Uh, so what they're doing is they're creating these vesicles with the gene of interest inside. The idea being there's nothing infectious or dangerous about a vesicle. So theoretically there should be no uh, dangers involved with, with using these liposomes or vesicles. So these are some ideas that are out there right now on how to make gene therapy safer but still get the benefit of replacing this gene in your patient. The last topic that I want to talk about here is how we can analyze a patient's genome. Two different techniques, uh, DNA fingerprinting and microarray analysis that I'm going to talk about here in this technique. Let's talk about uh, fingerprinting first. Now, in 2001, the human genome was completely mapped. Uh, they used over 1,000 different donors um, where they sequenced their DNA and, and uh, created this human genome map uh, of what the human genome is. Some interesting things came out of that. First off, 80% of human DNA is identical to mouse DNA, 80%. 60% of human DNA is identical to rice plant DNA. So vast majority of our DNA is common between all eukaryotes. That was the first thing that was kind of surprising. There weren't very many pieces of DNA that separated us from other organisms on the planet. 
The other thing that was kind of surprising and, and very interesting was that there were large sections of the human chromosome that don't encode anything. Those are called introns. Remember that humans, just like all eukaryotes, have introns, these non-coding sections of DNA. Remember the coding sections are called exons. Excuse me, exons are the coding sections of DNA, introns are the non coding sections of DNA, and they are interspersed amongst each other. In fact, apparently, as much as 80% of the human genome is made up of introns, which means the vast majority of our DNA has no known function. Very interesting. Well, in fact, what that really means is that random mutations um, are passed on from one generation to the next, mainly in those introns. Let me explain what I mean. Random mutations can occur everywhere in the genome. In fact, the exact same mutation rate is found everywhere on the human genome. But mutations in introns are more likely to be passed on through the generations. For example, if my great-great-great-great-grandfather had a random mutation in his exon, a coding section, then likely that mutation would mean that one of his proteins did not work correctly. And if the protein didn't work correctly, then this cell wouldn't work correctly. And if the cell wouldn't work correctly, he probably would not have survived in order to have babies. Therefore, that mutation would not be passed on. If, however, my great-great-great-great-grandfather had a random mutation in his intron, the intron doesn't encode anything. Therefore, there's no detriment. So it's easily passed on through generations. If he had that mutation, when he had a baby, the baby has a mutation. When that baby had a baby, its baby has the same mutation. It's passed on through the generations. So for that reason, random mutations that are, are in the introns are more likely to be successfully passed from generation to generation than random mutations in the exons. In fact, if we compare exon sequence between individuals, 99.99% of our DNA in our exons is identical because your cells have to work correctly, so you can't have mutations in your exons. But if we look at your introns, if we compare introns between different humans, we don't see as much similarity in identity because it doesn't matter if there are mutations in the introns. This allows the, developments of what are, the development of what are called polymorphisms. Polymorphisms are differences between humans in their intron sequences. Let's look at an example. Here we see introns for two different people, person one and person two. Right? So here's an intron for the first person. Here's the exact same intron for the second person. Now, if we compare sequences, they're almost identical, but there is one difference. There is one polymorphism. Here in this person, at this position, we see a T. But at this position in the other person, we see a C. That's a polymorphism. Polymorphisms are differences between humans in their intron sequence. Now, does this affect any protein, this difference? No, it doesn't. Is it better to have a T or a C in that position? It doesn't make any difference because this is the intron and the introns don't code for anything. So it doesn't make any difference one way or the other. Okay. However, it is a difference between humans. Now we can see this difference if we use a restriction endonuclease. Let's imagine. We take person one's intron, put it into test tube one. We take person two's intron, we put it into test tube two. Now, you put restriction endonuclease in the particular restriction endonuclease that we're going to use, cuts at TCAC. 
put that exact same restriction on a nuclease into both tube 1 and tube 2. Now, in tube 1, the restriction endonuclease is going to find a cut site. Right? Here's its cut site, TCAC. Right? So it's going to cut person 1's DNA. Is it going to cut person 2's DNA? And the answer is no. There is no TCAC sequence in person 2's intron, so it's not going to cut person 2's DNA. Well, so that means if we were to expose both of them to the same restriction endonuclease, person 1 would now have two fragments, while person 2 only had one fragment. You could also identify the size of these fragments. Person 1's two fragments are 5 and 9 nucleotides long. Person 2's fragment would be 14 nucleotides long. Well, we can see the size of the fragments if we run a technique, and that's gel electrophoresis. So if we use gel electrophoresis, here's our gel. We put the digested DNA of person 1 here, and the digested DNA of person 2 on the other spot. Now we have to expose it to a charge. Remember, DNA has a negative charge. It's going to move towards the positive electrode here. And how fast it moves depends on the size of the fragment. So person 1, we expect two fragments, one at 5 nucleotides and one at 9 nucleotides. And person 2, we expect one fragment at 14 nucleotides. In other words, we can tell if you have a T or a C according to the banding pattern. We know which of those two, which of those two options you have. We can identify that using a restriction endonuclease and gel electrophoresis. Well, it turns out that these introns, because, um, I'm sorry, these polymorphisms, because they are inherited and passed on from one generation to the next, we can begin to see patterns. For example, uh, there are some introns that are more common. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. There are some polymorphisms that are more common and some polymorphisms that are less common. There are some polymorphisms that are associated with a certain ethnic background and other polymorphisms that are associated with a part of the world that you may have been from. So, for example, if we did this sort of a test where we said, all right, well, here, uh, we took two people's introns, we cut them with a restriction endonuclease, the same restriction endonuclease, ran it on a gel, we can tell that these two people have a different polymorphism. We can tell that this person has a T at that polymorphism, and this person has a C at that polymorphism, or at least not a T is what we know, right. um, using, using this sort of fingerprinting. So it's often surprising to students to recognize that when we identify somebody using DNA fingerprinting, we're not looking at the coding genes. In fact, the coding genes are almost identical between all humans on the planet. So we're not looking to say, ooh, she has the blue-eyed gene, or oh, look at that, she has the brown-haired gene. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at your non-coding introns. We're looking at polymorphisms, because that's where you are most different from other people on the planet. Um, another example here. Um, here we're using DNA fingerprinting in a forensics case. You can take your different samples, whatever these samples may be. Maybe you have a sample from the victim. Maybe you have a sample from the crime scene. Maybe you have a couple samples from different suspects. You expose all four of these samples to the exact same restriction endonucleases, and then you run them on a gel. The fragments uh, show up because of their polymorphisms, just depending on what particular polymorphisms they have at each of those sites using this technique. Right? So if we look at our results here, um, 
of course here we have a marker, a ladder, so we can see the size and they repeat the ladder several times here in lane 5 they have it and then lane 9. Then they took a sample from the victim and you can see the victim has a very large band and then the victim has four smaller bands here from those from the victim's polymorphisms. Here from evidence you can see there are two large polymorphisms. Uh, maybe there's a faint one here and then there's three small polymorphism bands here. And then if we look at the two different suspects you can obviously tell which suspect has the same polymorphisms as our evidence and that would be suspect 1, right? Suspect 1's polymorphisms line up with all of our bands from the evidence indicating that suspect 1 is the perpetrator. Now just how accurate can we get using this technique? Well, let's imagine uh, that this first polymorphism, let's say this particular polymorphism only shows up one out of every 20 humans on the planet. And maybe this polymorphism here, here shows up only one out of every 10 humans. And maybe this one shows up one out of every 25 humans. This one's only one out of every 50 humans. And maybe this one's a little more common. It shows up one out of every it shows up one out of every four humans. Right? Well using statistics we multiply all that out and that would say that this particular group of polymorphisms only shows up one out of every million human beings on the planet. Which means we know that this suspect is the perpetrator one out of every million people would have the exact same group of polymorphisms depending on how common that uh, group of polymorphisms is, we can sometimes get even more closely um, associated. Maybe one out of every 10 million or 100 million people would have that particular group of polymorphisms, just depending on uh, what we found for that particular scenario. And that's fingerprinting, identifying a human based on their polymorphisms. This is how the government found um, Ted Kaczynski, by the way, is using polymorphisms. Uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, sent a threatening letter to the IRS, and he made the cardinal mistake of licking the stamp when he sent that letter. Um, and when they did fingerprint analysis on the DNA from the stamp, they had no idea who it was. Um, they did start to investigate who this possibly could be uh, and when they ran it past all DNA databases it actually came back as a partial match to a guy in the Midwest who turns out to be Ted Kaczynski's brother. I can't remember why his brother's DNA had been on file. I'm not sure if he had donated DNA or maybe had applied to the police academy or something or other, but at any rate, his DNA profile was on, on file. They compared the polymorphisms of that Unabomber's uh, stamp lick to the uh, Ted Kaczynski's brother, and they knew that they had a close relative because uh, there were so many polymorphisms in common. Not exactly the right guy, but a close relative. So they found out that this guy had a brother, and sure enough, uh, the brother turned out to be the Unabomber. Another example, just a couple months ago, um, the LA, LAPD caught somebody they'd been looking for for a while. They used to call him the Grim Sleeper um, because he would break into women's houses in the middle of the night and rape them. Um, and there was a long time period between attacks. So they called him the Grim Sleeper, but they never knew who he was. They had DNA uh, that they had collected from the scene, but it didn't match anybody. Well, now they're getting a great big database full of all of these different DNA hits uh, different DNA sequences and every time uh, somebody gets arrested they they take that DNA sample and they run it against their database. Well what happened is someone got arrested they ran the DNA against this database and it came up as a lot of similarity with whoever the grim sleeper was. Wasn't exactly the same but close similarity, a close relative. 
So they went in and they went and investigated and it turned out it was this guy's dad. The guy who had been arrested, his dad was the grim sleeper and they found it uh, through looking at familial similarities between individuals because remember polymorphisms are passed on from one generation to the next. In fact, there are certain polymorphisms that have been associated with various ethnic backgrounds. There are polymorphisms that are associated uh, with Viking descent. There are polymorphisms that they have associated with an Asian descent. There are polymorphisms that are associated with being um, Native American, uh, African. So we can uh, start to look at some of those polymorphisms as being indicative of somebody's uh, ethnic background. For example, there was, uh, after the Titanic disaster, um, you know, a lot of, especially the poor people that died after the Titanic uh, sank, a lot of them were buried in unmarked graves. They didn't know. They didn't bother to figure out who these people were. They just kind of buried them. Um, well, there was a town in Canada that had buried a young girl. Um, uh, actually, I don't know. I'm not even sure if they knew if it was a girl. They buried a young person at any rate. They knew steerage class um, and didn't know who this young child was. Well, what the town did about, mm, about 10 years ago, they did this. Maybe not quite that long. Maybe seven years ago. But they uh, exhumed the body. They took DNA samples from the long bones where you could still find bone marrow. They did fingerprinting analysis on it. And they found specific bands that are known to be associated with Celtic descent, indicating that she probably was from Scotland, Ireland, or possibly England, especially Northern England. So they went in, they look at the passenger manifest, and they found families who had children the right age from Ireland, Scotland, and Northern England. They went to the current family members from those families, and they asked for DNA samples so they could compare and they were actually able to find the family that had exact polymorphisms in common with this girl and they were able to identify who this child was and return the child to the family so that the child could be buried um, uh, in, in, in their home country so it turned out to be a Scottish child and so that's another benefit. There have been studies using fingerprinting that, that map the movement of Vikings across the globe hundreds of years ago. Um, there are polymorphisms associated with Nordic descent. And so when those polymorphisms show up in a culture, we know it's because Vikings were moving into the area. So they can map the, the movement of Vikings across the earth. Uh, same is true, a lot of work has been done on the movement of Asian people across the land bridge into Alaska and then down through North America, um, creating current, modern day Native Americans. Um, a lot of that has been studied using polymorphisms that we know are of Asian background and Asian descent and they can map the spread of peoples that way. Very cool technique and again, all looking at polymorphisms, differences in these non-coding sections of DNA. The other technique I want to talk about here, the last one, is called microarray analysis. Microarray analysis is truly different from any of the te other techniques we've talked about. In this case, we're not actually looking at the uh, genome of the patient. Instead, we're looking at expression. Remember, expression means transcription and translation, which genes are being turned on and which genes are not. So microarray analysis determines the expression of a gene by looking at the mRNA that's in the cell. Remember, expression means transcription and translation, and transcription produces mRNA. The idea here being that you can look at the health versus disease aspect of a patient. You could compare uh, a healthy cell to a cancerous cell and you could see which genes are being expressed and which genes are not being expressed. You could also look at growth versus differentiation as uh, patient cells uh, move on from one phase of its cycle to another. You can look at that development using microarray analysis and our hope is to improve the accuracy of both diagnosis as well as treatment. Let's look at how this technique works. Actually, before we do that, <laughs> background here. Think to yourself, 
Uh, if you think about two different cells in your body that have very different functions, for example, uh, let's think about a kidney cell, so a cell in your kidney, and compare it to an eyeball cell, right? cell in your eye. If you compare the kidney cell to the eyeball cell, do they have the same DNA or do they have different DNA? They have the same DNA. In fact, all cells of your body have the exact same DNA. Right? They all have the exact same genetic information. So then what makes a kidney cell different from an eyeball cell? Well, a kidney cell has all the DNA but only expresses kidney proteins. And the eyeball cell has all of the cells, uh, has all of the DNA, but only expresses eyeball proteins. So they have the same DNA, but it's not really the DNA that's so important, it's the expression. Which genes are being turned on, are being expressed, and which genes are not being expressed. Now we can see expression using microarray analysis. We start out here with our patient cells. You isolate mRNA from your patient cells. Remember, mRNA is produced during transcription. So it's an excellent indicator of what's being transcribed or expressed. So you isolate the mRNA from your patient cells, and then you wash it over a disc. I'm showing this disc in gray here. And this disc has all of the human genes attached to it. There are approximately 31,000 different human genes, and each one of them has been attached to the surface of this disc. So here's gene 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, etc., etc. All of the human genes have been attached to the surface of this disc. So you isolate mRNA from your patient cells, wash it over the surface of this disc, and any mRNA, when it finds its complementary gene, it's going to stick through base pair rules. Remember, mRNA is complementary to the DNA that it was made from. So the mRNA will bind to its complementary gene on the disc, wherever that gene happens to be. Then you wash off the excess, a little rinse, and you put that disc into a reader. And the microarray reader knows where each gene is located on the disc, and it will identify which genes are being expressed and which genes are not. Which genes are being overexpressed, too much production, or underexpressed, too little. So, for example, if we think about something like breast cancer, turns out that we have now identified several different genes that are associated with breast cancer. Some patients have breast cancer because they're overexpressing a certain gene. Other patients have breast cancer because they're underexpressing a different gene. Right? They're make so either they're making too much of one protein or they're making not enough of the other protein. Two totally different reasons to have breast cancer. If we analyze their DNA, they may have the exact same DNA, but really what's important is the expression of that DNA. The microarray analysis technique will allow us to tell expression. So if you take your patient's cells, isolate mRNA from the cells, wash it over a microarray with all the human genes attached to it, rinse off the excess, and then put your, your disc into a reader, this reader will identify expression levels of every single gene. Uh, this particular company, now the, the machine will know exactly which gene is in which location, this company, um, if you see it in green, green means underexpression, red means overexpression, black means severe overexpression, yellow is normal expression levels. So you put this disc into the reader and the reader will spit out, well, your patient is making too much of this particular protein in black, 
making too much of this particular protein, this reddish black, and this one as well. Your patient's not making enough of this green dot, sorry, this green dot here. Your patient's also not making enough of this green dot. Your patient has normal levels of all of these yellow ones. Right. So you'll get a printout of exactly what's happening in your patient's cells. So you can identify not only the patient has breast cancer, but exactly what's causing it. Overexpression of one gene or underexpression of another. And of course, those are two totally different reasons and require two totally different treatments. So if we look back here at microarray analysis, microarray analysis determines the expression of a gene by looking at the mRNA that's present in your patient's cell. It can tell health versus disease, so you can identify if your patient has a particular disease looking at expression. Not only that, but it can identify what form of that disease, exactly what's causing the problem. You can also see what point certain cells are in in your patient, growth versus differentiation here. And the hope is that we can improve the accuracy of diagnosis and treatment. Not only will, be, will we be able to say that a patient has breast cancer, we'll be able to say a patient has breast cancer because they are overexpressing gene 468 or they are underexpressing gene 232. Right? We can be very specific in that diagnosis. And of course, treatment. There is the possibility of starting treatment and then going back periodically and checking to see if you're affecting expression uh, and increasing or decreasing dosage. That's the idea behind microarray analysis. Um, I did post a little uh, virtual lab for microarray analysis as well. It's also through University of Utah's website. They go into more detail on microarray analysis than I just did. You are responsible for knowing it at the level that I discuss it in lecture. Uh, but it is definitely a nice little uh, reminder about expression and transcription and translation and also talking about the microarray. I would encourage you to look over at the University of Utah's genetic site. They have all kinds of cool stuff in there. All right, um, if you have any questions, of course, you should post them on the discussion boards or send me a message or come to my office hours, and I will see you guys soon.